We're going to be looking at storage systems in a bit more depth today, including removable storage and secondary storage. We're also going to be looking at the principal operations of hardware devices, where all of this falls under in the syllabus, and just continue on with our understanding of embedded systems and how they're different from normal general purpose computer systems. So let's begin. As usual, we'll start with looking at some key terms first. Now you should be familiar with hard disk drives and what they are, and perhaps you've encountered the term latency, which is basically another short term for lag. And in storage devices that can happen when, say for example, the head, which is on a magnetic hard disk drive, needs to seek a new sector, so that time it takes to travel is what the latency is. Then there's things like fragmentation for hard disk drives, where you might store data on non-consecutive sectors in different places, which make it very difficult to read or change or even delete the data. You probably come across removable hard disk drives, solid state drives, which use no moving parts, basically are made out of logic gates. Then of course you've got flash memory, another example of solid state devices, optical storage, CD, DVDs and Blu-rays. All of this is something you should be familiar from last year. And then, you, of course, you've got terms like dual layering, which apply to DVDs, where you use two recording layers, and birefringence, which is a problem with DVDs caused by refraction of laser light, which then split into two light beams, and that can cause data corruption and difficulty with reading data from DVDs and so forth. Now, you're familiar with computer systems, but we're going to start by looking at embedded systems, which basically are systems on a chip. So small devices like GPS navigation systems, to a certain extent, smartphones, you've got DVD players, washing machines, game consoles, smart watches, even things like traffic lights and MRI machines, robots, autonomous cars, all of these use some kind of embedded system. So you need to know that computers are not just the traditional form factor, they can be in all kinds of varieties and all types of forms. So you name it, we can think of a way of embedding a computer system into a unique shape. So think about access points, air conditioners all around you. Now these embedded systems have benefits and disadvantages as well. And generally they tend to be very small in size. Therefore, these embedded systems can be very easy to fit into these smaller types of devices. And they're very low cost to make because, you know, you're not requiring a huge amount of RAM, storage capacity, bigger screens, and all of those kind of things. But they're normally dedicated to one task. Uh, of course, there are exceptions to the cause, like smartphones, which you can use for multiple tasks, but normally they're dedicated to one task. And often they have simple interfaces, there's no requirement for an operating system, they consume very little power, and they're very fast to changing input. Now, with mass production, obviously, you get reliability as well. So if you're producing these devices on scale, you can eliminate all sorts of flaws in them. But obviously, the disadvantage is you can't upgrade them. And if you have a problem, that becomes the task of a specialist opening a phone. Not everybody can do that, but opening a computer, I think the average user should be able to do that. And of course, the interface is very, very simple. And that can be confusing to people as well because think about you know operating a microwave you've got limited buttons you've got a small display and if you don't know what you're doing most people just use the timer and just press the start button and that's about it really and of course any device that can be accessed over the internet for example if you've got a smart fridge or a smart tv chances are that a hacker can probably get access to that and see what you're up to but the biggest problem is that because of the difficulty in upgrading and fault finding, these devices are often just thrown away rather than being repaired. So they contribute to a huge amount of e-waste, which is a significant ethical and environmental concern these days. Now let's start by looking at secondary storage now. Again, going back to IGCSE, you should be familiar with the need for secondary storage. These are devices which are not directly accessible by the CPU. If a storage device is directly accessible by the CPU, it falls into the bracket of primary storage. So you're thinking RAM and ROM. Secondary storage, on the other hand, these are non-volatile devices, often very slow, which allow data to be stored as long as required by the user. Now, the storage capacity is quite great because it's a slow storage, so you get a lot of quantity as well. And 
everything, your applications, your operating system, any device drivers, any files that you save are stored on secondary storage. Generally, secondary storage falls into one of three categories, magnetic, solid state, and optical, and we're going to be looking at all three of these. Now do pause the video and see if you can identify from the images which ones are magnetic, which ones are optical, and which ones are solid state. Now hopefully you picked up that the magnetic hard drive is the one on the top left, then you've got a Blu-ray which is optical, you've got an SD card which is solid state, a magnetic tape going at the bottom, and towards the right you've got an Xbox Halo optical disc. Then you've got a solid state Nintendo DS cartridge, a Samsung SSD which is solid state, a USB pen drive which is solid state as well, a magnetic floppy disk. Going up to the top is a SanDisk SD card, micro SD card. And then you've probably got something like an iPod which is a solid state device as well. So storage devices come in all shapes and sizes and of all types. Now a task I would probably ask you to do would be to Create a structure chart where you can list the common storage devices based on categories. So you probably start with secondary storage at the top and then go to magnetic, solid state, optical. And then you list down the different devices that can go under each category. So you might want to do some research on it. Now hard disk drives are magnetic and data is stored in a digital form on magnetic surfaces of disks and platters. And these platters can spin at around 7,000 times a second. So the number of read and write heads can access all of the services in the disk drive about 50 times a second. So these read and write heads are moving very, very quickly. And each platter will normally have two surfaces which can be used to store the data, top and bottom. And data is stored on the surface in sectors and tracks. And a sector on a given track will contain a fixed number of bytes. Unfortunately, hard disk drives have very slow data access when compared to RAM. And predominantly is that a term which we're going to look at later is called latency that that is introduced here because that's the time these heads have to move between various different tracks and sectors to find the information that you need, read it and then transmit it back. So latency is quite important and many applications that constantly require you to use reading and writing, they constantly seek for the correct blocks of data and require a lot of head movements. And this effect of latency becomes very significant. So in technical terms, latency is defined as the time it takes for a specific block of data on a data track to rotate around to the read and write head. Because remember, the, the magnetic disks are spinning, the head's also moving. And users will sometimes notice the effect of latency when they see messages as, please wait, or you know your system is not responding. That's basically your hard drive is looking for the data and it hasn't found the data to act upon so everything pauses till it gets that particular data. In other terms when you're kind of streaming games you kind of think of this as lag but basically it's just latency. Another issue with hard disk drives is fragmentation. So what happens over time is that ideally hard disk drives start by storing data next to each other so it's quicker to read and quicker to write but over time the number of read and writes you know, changes and programs are deleted and files are written, deleted, rewritten, and these sectors end up being not adjacent to each other. So what happens is that the performance of the hard drive deteriorates because I, initially it was just finding everything next to each other, but now it needs to do a lot of head movements and a lot of spinning to get the data. Now defragmentation software can be used to tidy up disk sectors by making sure that everything is organized in blocks, in sequential blocks again, which makes it easier to read and write. Now an HDD is a direct access device, however data in a given sector will be read sequentially. So just be aware of that. It's not a true random access device. Removable hard disk drives are essentially HDDs that you connect to your computer using a USB port and you can use those as backup devices or and a way of transferring data between different computers. Now, of course, to address the challenge of latency and wear and tear, SSDs came about. And SSDs, or solid state drives, reduced this issue, especially latency, considerably. Since there's no moving parts, and you can access all the data at the same rate, 
you speed things up. Now, the most common type of SSDs store data by controlling the movement of electrons within NAND chips. And the data is stored in zeros and ones in millions of tiny transistors, and we know them from logic gates. So normally what happens is at each junction, there's a transistor, which is called a floating gate, and the other is called a control gate within the chip. And both are used to ensure that data is stored within that particular transistor. Now this effectively produces a non-volatile rewritable memory, kind of like EEPROM. And the holy grail basically is to create an SSD which operates at the same speed and offer huge amounts of storage capacity for cheap. And that will usher in a new era of super fast computing. We're now going to look at the use of EEPROM and what the main difference is between SSDs and EEPROM. So the main difference is the kind of chips that we use to construct them. So the use of NOR chips rather than NAND chips. So SSDs normally use old NAND technology, which is cheap, which is reliable. NOR is a bit more expensive, and that's where EEPROM comes into play. EEPROM also allows data to be read or erased in a single byte at a time, and the use of NAND only allows blocks of data to be read or erased. So EEPROM is much more useful for RAM because you can deal with single bytes rather than blocks of bytes. Because of this feature, EEPROM technology is more useful in applications where data needs to be accessed or erased in bite-sized chunk. And because of the cost implications, most solid-state drives are normally NAND technology, which makes a lot of sense. Now, there's quite a lot of benefits of SSDs. SSDs are more reliable because of no moving parts, nothing to go wrong there. They are, of course, very light. You do not have to get them up to speed because think about an optical disk or a magnetic disk. You will need to spin it first to reach that particular speed it's needed to, you know, 7,000 times per second, and then the read and write heads move or the lasers move. You don't need any of that with SSDs. Of course, they have low power consumption because you're not know, spinning pieces of metal around. They run much cooler and they're very, very thin. And that's why we have all these slim phones and slim televisions and devices coming out these days. Now, access to data is considerably faster, again, because of no moving parts, latency isn't as enormously high as you would get in hard disk drives or even in Blu-rays and DVDs. Now, a typical question you could be asked is, why are SSDs suitable for mobile phones or an alternative device like tablets? And you should be able to answer that. And hopefully you just noticed the video which was on screen, which showcases that using an SSD, you end up with boot up time of about 11 seconds compared to an HDD, which goes close to a minute. Now, of course, there are some drawbacks to SSDs as well. And the main drawback is that we still don't know how long they last. Most solid state storage devices are rated at only 20 GB write operations per day over a three year period. This is known as SSD endurance. So that basically means that they're not very suitable for servers, which need to constantly write huge amounts of data per day. So we're still using hard disk drives in, in big server-based operations rather than SSDs. Also note that it's not possible to overwrite existing data on a flash memory device. It is first necessary to erase the old data and then write the new data at the same location. Whereas with HDDs, you can just simply overwrite previous files by just changing the magnetic polarity and so forth. So there's some drawbacks to this as well. So memory sticks, why are they called flash? And one of the reasons they were called Flash was because Toshiba had an engineer. And when he first came about with creating these type of devices, somebody responded that they are super quick, like the flash of a camera. And that's where the name got stuck. So memory sticks or flash memories, also known as pen drives, use solid state technology. They usually connect using a USB port. And the main advantage is they're small, lightweight, which makes it easy for them to transfer files between computers. They can also be used as small backup devices. And if you have complex or expensive software, you can often use memory stick as a dongle for additional security. Without plugging this memory stick in, the software will not work. So it prevents illegal or unauthorized use of software and also prevents the copying of software since without a dongle, it is useless. You need to have a dongle to make it run. Now let's move on to optical storage. CDs and DVDs are described as optical storage devices and normally laser light is used to read data from and write data onto the surface of a disk. So normally disk is organized in spiral tracks which run from the center to the outer part of the disk 
and you've got pits or bumps which are basically created using the laser and then red by re reflecting light from it so a laser light is shown on on the surface and depending on the reflection zeros and ones are red optical storage requires a thin layer of metal alloy or light sensitive organic dye which is coated over a particular piece of metal that's used to construct cds and dvds and blu-rays and normally you have a single spiral track that runs from the center of the disc to the edge and when a disc spins the optical head moves to the point where the laser beam contacts the disc surface and follows the spiral track from the center outwards as with a hdd the cd dvd is split into sectors and tracks and sectors are quite common across both which allow direct access of data now also which is common in hdds the outer part of the disc runs faster than the inner part of the disc why is that think about basic physics smaller tracks internally outer is longer so you need to spin that a bit more to, to have the same time frame now the data is stored in pits and bumps on the track and the red laser is used to read and write the data for cd and dvds and blu-ray of course uses a blue laser now there are different formats you have r which is only write once so you have cd-rom which is written by the manufacturer and you can't change it then you have cd-r or dvd-r or blu-ray r which can only be written once and then you obviously have the rw variety which can be written and read from multiple times now we're just going to have a look at dual layering because in dvds and blu-rays we often have limited sizes so people think about ways of increasing storage capacity on, on on a disc and the way we do that is we normally use two individual recording layers and these two layers especially on a dvd are joined together with a transparent polycarbonate spacer and a very thin reflector is sandwiched between the two layers now you can see that in the diagram you've got your first layer then you've got your second layer and then you've got those polycarbonate layers on top of those as well and reading and writing of the second layer is done by a red laser focusing at a fraction of a millimeter difference compared to the the first layer so data is stored in alternative sections which helps increase the capacity of the dvd now how did we increase the capacity from cds to dvds to blu-ray it's all about physics now standard single layer dvds have a large storage capacity than cds because the pit size and the track width are both smaller compared to what's on the cd this means that the more data can be stored on a dvd surface dvds use lasers with a wavelength of 650 nanometers and cds use lasers with a wavelength of 780 nanometers so the shorter the wavelength of the laser light the greater the storage capacity of the medium itself now blu-ray uses a blue laser rather than a red laser to carry out read and write operations so the wavelength of the blue light is only 405 nanometers compared to 650 nanometers for red light so that basically means that the pits and bumps can be much smaller consequently blu-ray can store up to five times more data than a dvd now blu-ray uses a single 1.1 mm thick polycarbonate disc dvds use a sandwich of two 0.6 millimeter thick discs so you end up roughly at the same size now using two sandwich layers can cause something called birefringence which means that the light is refracted onto two separate beams causing reading errors and because blu-ray uses only one layer the discs do not suffer from this effect blu-rays automatically come with a secure encryption system as well which helps to prevent piracy and copyright infringement and sony is credited with that because sony wanted their mediums their playstation discs their movies their music to be secure from illegal copying and blu-ray allows that to happen so it's very difficult to burn blu-ray discs it's not impossible but it's much more tougher than cds and dvds now on screen you will see a comparison between cd dvds and blu-rays the type of laser color the type of wavelength disc construction method and the track distance so pause the video and perhaps jot some of these things down because they're very useful to do a technical comparison in exams rather than just a word-based comparison now that's the end of the lesson for today what i want you to do is i'm going to set your task to find out about pram which is called parameter ram and pc ram phase change ram so find out how these are going to impact future computer development okay so by now you should know the relationship between latency and fragmentation 
for example, the more fragmented a hard drive is, the greater the latency. How would you go about speeding a magnetic hard disk drive? What are the two different approaches to creating an SSD? Think about NAND and NOR. What is the main advantage of a removal of hard disk drive and memory sticks? Two benefits and drawbacks of SSDs. You should be able to explain the differences between the different optical media and the concepts of dual layering and birefringence as well. Okay, we'll end the lesson here for now and I'll catch up with you in the next one.